our deepest fears that we are powerful beyond measure. I will live every day as if there were a microphone tucked under my tongue. It's great to get in the game, but don't get in the game until you understand the rules till you're an insider. Your life changes when you begin having a different conversation in your head. What we need to do in radically deep problems is propose radically visionary solutions. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Welcome to our festive Power Cut series, where the Inside Influence team take a six-week pause over Christmas to reset, read, recalibrate, and generally refill our creative tanks. Oh, and, you know, we'll probably eat a few mince pies while we're at it. To keep you fueled while we're gone, we have traveled back through the archives of the last 12 months and pulled out six of our favorite Inside Influence episodes of the year. Then we take those, we cut them down even further into the most powerful moments that I can say hand on heart have radically changed how I have shown up, led and influenced over the past 12 months. No fluff, just 20 minutes of solid wisdom. If you're new to the Inside Influence community, enjoy the ride. If you are a long time listener, these moments, I promise you, are so worth a refresh. Today's Power Cut is with Doug Conant. Doug is the only former Fortune 500 CEO who is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, a top 50 leadership innovator, a top 100 leadership speaker, and one of the 100 most influential authors in the world. He is the founder and CEO of Conant Leadership, former president and CEO of Campbell Soup Company and former chairman of Avon Products. His Wall Street Journal bestselling book co-authored with Amy Federman is called the Blueprint, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights. He is also the New York Times bestselling co-author of Touchpoints, Creating Powerful Leadership Connections in the Smallest of Moments. In this part of our conversation, we are discussing how to build your leadership blueprint, how to build a blueprint as a leader that's going to make you stand apart from the crowd, why you're only alone in leadership if you choose to be including how to create your own entourage of excellence. And I have used that term so many times this year. Plus why great leaders make it personal. Because let's face it, nothing great has ever been accomplished in an impersonal way. If you enjoy this Power Cut episode and would like to hear my full conversation with Doug, check out episode 132, 132 on either my website, juliemasters.com or any of your usual favorite podcast hangouts. But for now, sit back, relax, stride on, ride out and enjoy my Power Cut conversation with Doug Connett. When I do talks, uh, when I have slides, one of the slides I use is my entourage of excellence, which I call a tapestry. And it's the pictures of the people that I carry with me. You know, and Maya Angelou, I, I encourage you to go do this. Maya Angelou, if you Google Maya Angelou, rainbows in my clouds, okay? Uh, she does, it's two minutes long. And, uh, and, and, you know, we often talk that leadership is a lonely pursuit. You're all alone. And I also say that's bullshit, too. You're only alone if you choose to be. And Maya Angelou will, in this little rainbows in my clouds, she talks about rainbows in her clouds. She says, I've had a lot of clouds, but I've had a lot of rainbows, too. All these people that have had a positive influence on me, when I go up on the stage or when I go to teach a class, I say to all those people, I say, come on with me. We're going up on stage now. Those are the six people that are in your shower. Come on with me. We're going up on the stage now. We're going to show up. She said, I bring them all with me. They're with me all the time. They are rainbows in my clouds. And then she challenges you, the listener, to say, okay, your challenge now is to be a rainbow in somebody else's clouds. And that's what we're talking about here. You know what these things look like. You know what good energy looks like in a deeply personal way that really speaks to you. And what we encourage people to do is build their own tapestry, create their own entourage of excellence, and then carry it with them all the time. I mean, I travel with mine. And, uh, you know, Stephen Covey's in it. Neil McKenna's in it. Maya Angelou's in it. 
uh, uh, Gandhi is in it, and a ton, a number of other people. I have way too many, but but I've been doing this a long time, and I've just I've learned so much from these people, and I've said, gosh, you know, my I had a favorite president president of the United States. His name was Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. And he did a lot of things wrong, but I loved his energy. And he had the eye of the tiger and he showed up and he engaged every day. And I want to bring that with me when I deal with the likes of you. Uh, <laughs> no, but when, when we're into this, this is important stuff, sacred ground. And I, I, I want to share my passion for it, and my energy for it, and uh, so I'm I'm channeling my inner Teddy Roosevelt right now, and uh, so I love your story. It, it's very aligned with my experience. We know what these people look like. There are lessons to be learned. We've learned them. Our challenge is to integrate them in, into how we show up every day, and you can do that. I want to I want to dive into the leadership model side of things as well while we're here because for me this is the the big, well intention is very huge if you do one thing let it be that but this model side of things which is where you get deeply practical about this is my leadership model these are the pillars of leadership that I strive to to model my entire behavior around can you Firstly, can you walk through what a model would look like? Again, let's just get practical with it. What does a model look like? And then we can move into how we develop our own. A model is anything that guides your thinking and your behavior in a direction where you're influencing others in a way that is showcasing the best version of yourself. Uh, my wife has a leadership model. And my wife is a creative actress educator. She's not me, for sure, thank God. And her leadership model is, is a set of words. It's travel well is her model. And she would say that to our kids. Travel well stands for take responsibility, add value, enjoy life. That's the travel. And well is a welcome everyone, live, love, and laugh, because she's always trying to find she always tries to get too much in, and she ended up with three L's for well. But that's, my, that's how my wife wants to walk in the world. Take responsibility, add value, enjoy life, welcome everyone, live, love, and laugh. And, uh, and that guides how she shows up. And if she ever has a bad day, she can look at that model and say, where did I go wrong? Did I take responsibility? Was I so empty today that I wasn't adding value? You know, or, or, or was I not welcoming to people? Uh, and so I, I, I picked that model. So that can be it. Mine is a sort of a, a geometric flywheel because I'm a model builder. Uh, so models take on, uh, are imbued with, the mindset of whoever has created it. We have master gardeners that think about leadership within a gardening metaphor. You know, we need the sun, we need the elements to shine on. We have to prune the tree or prune the plant in order for it to fully blossom. We have to take care of the conditions, the soil. So we have people that build leadership models that speak to them, that help them be the best version of themselves that are, it's a garden. We have, I have a, a world famous doctor uh, who among other things also happens to be a Star Trek geek. He goes and speaks at Star Trek conventions and his model is a rocket ship going off into the unknown and creating a team that's gonna get that rocket ship to where it needs to be. And it influences how he thinks about how he shows up every day. And if you're on his team, when you can articulate that model clearly, you get a rocket pin, which is one of his practices that, that brings that to life. And, uh, and, and along with many other practices that he's developed over the years. So these, pract these, these models take the shape we have marathoners 
that say, this is a long journey. I've got to take care of myself before I start the journey. And then I've got to take care of myself as I'm on the journey in order to finish the race. And uh, we have, oh, and we have lots of engineers and architects that are building buildings. The blueprint concept is about a building. And the whole blueprint notion uh, of the book is you got to build a strong foundation with your leadership in order to be able to withstand the, the winds and the challenges uh, that you're undoubtedly going to uncover. And your building has to hold up under the fiercest conditions. So we want you to build a very strong foundation based on reflection and study, you build a strong foundation, and then you have pillars that are, what are the three or four most important things to you that you wanna have captured in your model on top of that foundation? And then what are your values, which most people end up putting on the roof? The roof is my, it creates my values. The pillars reflect how I wanna show up. The foundation uh, uh, could be anything. We have trees, you, can, you know, with roots, and then the trunk is growing and the leaves and, and uh, you know, you can't get the fruits without the roots. And so this model piece is, is designed to create a platform for people to channel in a way that speaks deeply to them, their deepest held leadership beliefs and brings them to life in a metaphor that, that, that speaks to them and that ultimately they can share with the people that work with them with conviction because they're, they're, they've thought about it. They're not doing this by the seat of their pants. They're doing this with a purpose. And so this model piece is, uh, it, a model is in the eyes of the beholder, I guess mm -hmm. is my point. And I just suddenly got that at a whole different level. I just suddenly really, it just went, da -da, the, the weaving together of your story, the reflection piece, your personal story and your personal model of leadership, how those two pieces beautifully come together. You know, if you are somebody who loves gardening, then your model becomes a, a metaphor for gardening. If you're somebody who loves Star Wars or Star Trek, sorry, it becomes a, a model of a rocket. Like the, how deeply personal this process is. Yeah. Well, it, and it needs to be because uh, great leaders make it personal. Uh, nothing great was ever accomplished by anybody in an impersonal way. Not going to happen. You pouring yourself into how you do podcasts. If you were just asking questions, you know, here are the 10 questions I'm going to ask of every, won't work, won't work. You won't do anything of distinction and you can do better than that. And so this whole process is designed to be deeply personal and reflective of you and of you thinking about what's the best version of myself. And also knowing that whatever I come up with today, I can do better tomorrow. And I will in a, in a manageable, small practice, uh, very intentional way. And so you, all of a sudden you have a sense of purpose. You envision you reflect, you study, you build a leadership model, you identify practices. My number one, at the heart of my model is honor people. That's the number one thing I want to do, honor people. And so I have practices. You know, when I divide my model, I share with the class. I say, okay, and here's some practices I use, I, I've evolved into where I'm honoring people. I'm bringing that notion of honoring people to life. How can I help? Uh, that mindset and asking that question is, is, is one of my ways of honoring people. Another way, I started writing when I was a terrible interview, which I was. I, lucky I got a job. Uh, I needed to, uh, my output, Neil McKenna said, Doug, you're going to be a terrible interview. You've got to think about some way to distinguish yourself. What do you do if you're an introvert? Well, I had to come up with something. So I came up with a strategy that when I would go to interview at a, an office building, I would get the name of everybody that helped me. And then I, at the end, including the, 
receptionist at the front of the building. I would get their name. And I would go through my day. I would pay great attention to how they were helping. I would then leave the building. I would walk next door to the coffee shop. And I would handwrite a note to each person saying, thank you for your help today. It might have been three sentences. I appreciated this thing you did very tangibly. And, uh, and I would then walk it back to the office building, and I would deliver it to the receptionist. And on top would be the note to the receptionist. And guess what? Receptionists never get thank you notes. So, uh, and, and then I would, could you have these delivered either today or tomorrow morning? Oh, you know, and, and I want to deliver your note right now. And so they would deliver them. The next time I went back to that office building, oh, Doug, it's good to have you back. Who are you seeing today? How can I help you? Uh, so those thank you notes, I started writing those at Campbell, uh, Campbell Soup Company when I was the CEO. <laughs> and I was there for 10 years. I tried to write 10 to 20 notes a day to people that were making real accompl accomplishments of real significance. I had a two and a half hour commute to work. So I would sit there and read and write. And uh, on the way in, I would write 10 to 20 short notes celebrating contributions of real significance. I did it six days a week for 10 years. When I retired, uh, and it was my way of honoring people and, and honoring their work. It wasn't have a nice day. It was thank you for that great podcast I had an opportunity to be on yesterday. Or, and I particularly appreciated this part of the conversation. So it was specific. And, and so I 10 to 20 a day. They'd be sent out that day. And if it was in Australia and it was a real contribution, it would be FedEx to the employee's home. So they would open it with their family and they would see that this person got a thank you note from the CEO. Whoa. And so when I retired, I was being interviewed and the interviewer said, we hear you write a lot of notes. I said, well, I do 10 to 20 a day. I do it six days a week. It's sort of a habit, a, a practice. And uh, they said, well, how many of you are in? I don't know. We did the math. And I had sent out just to Campbell employees over 30,000 notes in 10 years and, and honoring people. And, uh, and we only had 20,000 employees. If you were at Campbell Arnott's in, in Melbourne, if you walked around the building, you would see handwritten notes from me stuck up on thumbtacks in cubicles from the CEO thanking you for some specific thing you did. Do you think everybody in the company didn't notice that the CEO was celebrating contributions of significance? All the people that worked for me said, do you expect us to write these notes too? I said, I don't care what you do, but I think we ought to be celebrating contributions of significance. Most organizations, you've interviewed a lot of people. Most organizations are great critical thinking machines. We're built to figure out what's wrong and to fix it. As a result, we spend way too much time focusing on what's not working when even in even the most difficult circumstances, typically in a company, eight out of 10 things are being done right. But nobody's talking about it. You've got two young children. If all you focused on was what they were doing wrong, they probably would not grow up to be well-rounded children. You are also celebrating what they're doing right, and you're trying to bring balance into that conversation. Same thing's true as a leader. So those two things, how can I help? And thanking people for contributions of significance were my way, two of my ways of honoring people. And they're simple, you know? Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and have seized hold of at least one tool, idea, or mindset that will help you start raising your own level of influence. Now, for those of you who want to take the next step in your journey or would just love a roadmap to becoming the most influential voice, idea, or brand in your space, then I have good news. 
You can now download the latest updated version of my ebook, The Influencer Code, from my website, juliemasters.com. Also, there's a link in the show notes. Just pop in your email address, and I promise I will not spam you, but it is jam packed full of ideas, tools, and case studies that I have come across in my now 20 plus years of doing this work. Not to mention the seven areas and seven core questions that I have found to be hands down the most valuable when it comes to immediately lifting your ability to make an impact download it keep it share it juice it for all it is worth i hope it makes a massive difference in both your career and your business thank you always to my co-founder and the main brain behind this podcast lauren kelly you kick my butt in all the right ways thank you for making it happen And if you did enjoy the show, then we would love you to share this podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever your platform of choice happens to be. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode.